326 out of 501 have logged in. Okay. Um, hi, we're going to do a, just a very quick uh, sound check. Want to make sure that you can hear us. Um, Brian, are you there? Can you say hello, please? And Marsha, are you there? Hello, hello. Oh, you're both there. Okay, we've got Brian, we've got Marsha. Uh, welcome. You, to, you can, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hi. Okay. Everyone can hear you. We're just doing a, a real quick sound check here, and I'd like to welcome um, our guests to our webinar, Basic Machine Maintenance. Little things can make a big difference, and they save big bucks. Um, today, we are very excited to have two technicians with us who are going to speak about maintaining your embroidery machine. Brian Chase first got into the embroidery business in 1998 as an embroidery tech at Hirsch International. In 2009, he founded BEC Embroidery Repair Services, specializing in the installation, service, and maintenance of Tajima, SWF, Toyota, and Ricoma embroidery machines. Marsha Shabbat began her career in 1983 as a machine operator of multi-head embroidery machines. In 1997, she joined Brother as a technical engineer for installations, service, and training. In 2002, she became a certified third-party tech and her own Backyard Creations was born. Marsha services Baradin, Brother, Tajima, and ZSK machines. Welcome to both of you. My name is Alice Wolf. I'm Madeira's Manager of Education and Publications, and I'm joined here at Madeira headquarters by Nancy Minnie, who is Madeira's Senior Marketing Coordinator and Resident Embroiderer. The two of us will be monitoring questions that come in, so please feel free to type in all of your questions. We'll collect every one that comes in. We'll make certain that each one is answered. And if we're not able to answer your question in real time, don't worry. We'll be sending them all out to you by email. Um, please stay with us throughout the webinar. We will be making a special offer at the end to thank you for spending this part of your day with us and also to provide you with contact information for Brian and Marsha. Also, to let everyone know, the webinar will be recorded, so it will be available to you if you'd like to see the recorded version um, at, your, at your leisure. Also, a PDF if anyone prefers um, a print version, and we'll be sending links to everybody for those two things. Um, okay, lots of material to cover today. Um, Nancy, could you please begin by letting people know what it is um, they can expect to, to learn today? Just a brief summary. Yes, absolutely, and welcome to everybody again. And so what we're going to be talking about today is we're going to um, take a look at the tools and the cleaning supplies that you want to have on on hand. You also want to um, establish a maintenance schedule. Um, you really want to think about doing that. We're going to give you some tips and tricks on doing that. And then once you do establish that, um, you want to keep track of that maintenance schedule. Additionally, we're going to talk about proper thread tensioning, and this is going to ensure that your thread um, as long as you're keeping that maintenance up, as long as you're doing this as well, you're going to have a good running machine as um, too. And also, you want to keep in mind that replacing your bobbin cases does involve um, part of your maintenance schedule as well. And additionally, the um, needle changes that need to happen, um, changing needles, I should say, um, that is going to happen. And just notice on the on our bottom graphic there, we do have a couple of needles that are broken um, purposely to show you um, that those should be included in there as well. Thank you, Nancy. Um, we've got questions that are coming in already, but let's um, start out with, um, Brian, I'm going to ask you to go over some of the tools that people should just maintain in their shops um, just for regular everyday use. Oh, good afternoon, everybody. Most important tools that you want to have in front of you all times, uh, obviously, is a screwdriver to be able to change your needles. Um, usually, a jeweler's repair kit um, has different size screwdrivers, so those always work for me. Um, you'll see in the bottom of the picture uh, a brush, two-sided brush. Um, those should have come with your machine. If they're long gone by now, you can get them from Adira, but they, the 
one end, the right hand end, is used for cleaning your uh, rotary hooks. Um, find it very, very easy to clean them, get the uh, dirt, lint, um, machine oil. Machine oil, um, I, I see a lot of people using different types of oil. Um, use what the manufacturer recommends. That's the best way to really explain it. Um, it's the oil that they have tested on the machines. It works the best. Um, as far as grease, um, I usually use uh, a wheel bearing grease, uh, unless you, again, if you have a manufacturer's grease, you know, work with that. Otherwise, regular um, wheel bearing grease works fine. Um, compressed air, I know a lot of you out there use canned air. Um, I'm a big fan of having an air compressor. You can get them relatively inexpensive, small, all that you can do when you need it. Um, and you're not buying cans of air, which, you know, this is just a better way uh, economically. Um, and that's about it. Um, one thing I wanted to point out, thank you, Brian, um, the WD-40 up there is a white, white lithium grease. Um, that is something that we'll talk about where that needs to go and all that. Um, but be aware that that's white lithium. That's not your white, um, your WD-40. So WD-40 is typically not something that a ma uh, machine manufacturer will recommend for lubrication. So um, somebody did ask that and wanted to clear that up front. Um, Marsha, I'm going to ask you to take the next slide. And, and while Marsha talks to establishing a maintenance schedule, Brian, could you check um, the connection of your microphone? We've had a couple people write in um, and make sure that they're saying that it's difficult to hear you. You're kind of breaking in and out. And we'll go on to the next slide. Marsha, what can you tell us? Okay, how about now? Can you try moving away from your microphone just a little bit? How about that? Yep, that sounds good, but just speak up a little bit. Okay, how about that? One, two? Yep, I think that's good. Okay. Are we Mark? all set? Yes, we're ready for you, Marsha. Well, good afternoon. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for coming, and I would like to thank Madeira for sponsoring this and having us attend. Um, as far as a maintenance schedule, um, most of the machines, or some of the machines, actually have some of them built into it. Um, if you don't have a machine that has it built in, some of the machines also will allow you to um, set it up within the machine. Um, if none of those work, one of the best things is to look at something that you're going to look at every single day. Um, using your calendar, using your calendar on your phone, using um, your Gmail, um, or if you use Outlook. Um, those are things that um, you could put it in to do it every single day. You could do it weekly. You can do monthly. Mostly it's recommended. Um, the daily ones, you guys, everybody tends to remember to do them. Um, weekly ones, usually those aren't the forgotten ones either. It's that three months, six months, every 12 months, those are the ones that people tend to forget. So if you put them into the, a calendar with a reminder at some format that you look at every single day, it's going to pop up and it's going to remind you that the maintenance needs to be done. Okay, thank you. Um, let's break down that maintenance schedule then into daily, weekly, monthly, three month, and six month. And this is where we'll spend most of our time. Um, I'm holding off a little bit on the questions that are coming in because I know that there are um, things that are going to be answered as we go through. So let's take a look first. Marcia, if you could talk to us about um, what you recommend is done daily to the machine. Okay, so on a daily basis, you should always, always clean out your rotary hook and the bobbin case area. You can use canned air, you can use a brush, or you can use a compressor, whatever you happen to have available to you. Do be aware of the compressor, depending upon the model machine you have. There are some electronic component parts nearby, so that may not be something that the manufacturer or the technician that sets your machine up is recommending. So if at all costs, us, just make sure that you, um, a brush will work the best, it's the cheapest, but canned air is quicker and it does a more thorough job. After you've cleaned it, you are then going to need to do some oiling. And as you can see here, there's two pitches in the middle of your screen. Um, one is pointing onto the side with a red arrow. 
um, and the other one has a red circle. Those are the two most common spots to put a drop of oil. Um, and when I say a drop of oil, it usually is done with a very fine oiler. It's not done with the one that has the long, big, heavy spout with it. Because too much oil in this area will get your bobbin soaked and will pull it back up onto your embroidery and then you're going to have to clean the garment. So you do want to make sure that you um, do the oiling after you do your cleaning. Um, and usually the way I recommend for people, the, most manufacturers recommend that you do it every four to six hours of continuous use. Key word there is continuous use. If you have a shop that they are coming in in the morning and they are running it straight for eight hours, the easiest way to remember how to do this. If you have breakfast, it wants breakfast. If you get to have lunch, it wants lunch. And if you're going to stay late and you have dinner, it's going to want dinner. So just remember, that's usually roughly about every four hours. So that would be the easiest way to remember to do your daily oiling and cleaning of your rotary hook area. Marsha, um, when it comes to blowing the air out of the bobbin case, I tend to do that every time I change the bobbin itself. Is that a good practice? Um, it's not going to hurt anything. Um, one of the biggest places, let alone that you have to blow air, and I did write a little side note here for me to remember, um, is to make sure that you clean underneath the tension spring. Just using a piece of paper or a piece of plastic, um, and you just run it under the same area that your thread goes under, and that will push out a lot of dirt and debris, and it will save you from having to redo the tension every single day and every time you do the bobbin. But you definitely should check it and clean it every time you're looking at it. Thanks. Brian, before we move on to um, weekly maintenance, do you have anything to add that, um, that Marsha might have left out or doesn't include that you would? No, pretty much everything she had said is what I would normally Same thing. Okay, two votes for exactly what, what Marsha explained. Let's move on to weekly maintenance. And Brian, would you like to start? Sure enough. Um, <clears throat> on the weekly maintenance, um, and I'm going to preface the statement, it really all depends on when you're oiling your needle bars, how much you're using the machine. If you're a general nine to five business, uh, five days a week, um, I would recommend oiling your needle bars every week and a half, maybe two weeks, because you don't want to saturate uh, the pads that are on the bottom of the needle bars. If you do that, then just like having too much oil in your rotary hook, it's going to get all over the place and probably on a white garment more likely. Machine, two shifts, three shifts, um, then I would definitely recommend once a week. Um, the last thing you want is have a needle bar seize up on you because you have lack of oil. Um, the second part, you'll see oiling the needle bar, uh, needle arm, and needle plate. Um, on the front of the arm of the what we call the rotary hook shaft, oscillating shaft, or the pads of manufacture, uh, you'll see a, a small hole in front of your needle plate. Um, I tend to do that daily, but again, on your machine, you can back off of that maybe every other day. Um, that's pretty much what I do there. Brian, a question came in about the tension spring, specifically on a Tajima. Um, someone writing in saying that they were told uh, by Tajima Tech not to use anything to clean the tension spring. Can you address that? Uh, could you repeat that question? You kind of faded in and out. Sorry. Oh, that's okay. Um, someone wrote in asking um, about well, explaining that they were told by a Tajima Tech that they should not um, use anything to clean the tension spring. With the tension spring on the needle bars or tension springs for your thread On the bobbin tension? case. On the bobbin case itself. Um, on the bobbin case itself. Um, no, that would be wrong. I would always keep that bobbin case clean. I have customers who do it. Uh, every time they change your bobbin, which I recommend, um, using anything from a business card, a piece of cardboard, uh, I have somebody that actually takes uh, water bottles, plastic water bottles, cuts them up in pieces, and they're able to clean under there, and it lasts you know, quite a long time. So keeping your bobbin case clean under that tension spring is an absolute. Okay, thank you. Um, still with uh, weekly? 
Brian? Okay. Um, as far as the oil tanks are concerned, I think Marsha can answer that better because that's more of a brother, a brother thing than with Tajima. So if you want to take that one, Marsha. I will gladly do that. Um, the picture that you're seeing there are oil tanks, and what oil tanks do on a brother machine is there is a bunch of wicks that fall into these two tanks. Um, one part of the tank, the first side, the front part of it actually takes care of the front of the machine, and the second one takes care of the back of the machine. Um, these should definitely be filled at least once a week, and they should just maintain a level about halfway up the, up the glass. Um, a lot of technicians, including myself, will take a magic marker and actually draw a line so that you guys will have an idea of how far up to fill it. Now, as you're using your machine during the week, it will go down, especially the front one. It is meant to. Do not panic. The back one will definitely take over and send some oil over to the front. Or if you are a little nervous, you can always put more oil into it. The other picture that you see here is actually on a brother machine also. This is a um, felt pad. Um, and you can only see it through um, a site that you actually remove a grommet, which is um, located to the right-hand side of the take-up levers on each of the heads. Um, and this is where that zoom spout oiling container comes in to um, be very, very helpful because you can telescope it really long and then you take a flashlight and you'll be able to look in and see the felt pad. Now you do need to be careful with this. Do not over oil it because again it will run over the head, down the sides, on your machine and it will take you probably at least three or four runs to clear it up. Um, usually most, some of my customers have complained that if they do this particular one weekly that they do tend to have a lot of oil. So it's usually recommended by the manufacturer to do it once a week, but if you're having difficulty and you're over-oiling it and you're a little heavy-handed, you can always go to doing it every other week until you reach a point that this is satisfactory. Marcia, a similar question to you that we put to Brian. Uh, somebody wrote in saying that they were told not to oil needle bars on their brother machine. Um, needle bars always need to be oiled. Again, they shouldn't be oiled using a fine oiler needs to oil each and every one of them and actually most of the brother if you look at their um, I don't know if they have it up on their website but I do know in their books on the um, single head machines they actually recommended to oil it in two spots one being um, right where your springs are just above your presser feet or actually on a single head there's only one presser foot but and then the next spot they actually ask you to recommend it to do the oiling is you go in between each one of the slots just underneath the take-up lever and you actually hit that part of it too. Um, so it is definitely recommended to do it. Um, if you don't, you're going to seize up your needle bars and that becomes pretty expensive to have a technician come in and have to take one of those out mainly if it seizes up. Mm. How about on um, the Brother PR-1000? Um, does that have an oil tank on that machine, do you know? No, the PR-1000 does not, and it also does not, that probably, that's probably the only model that needs, like, almost next to no oil. Um, the manufacturer just recommends that you oil the rotary hook every day, that you use it, but as far as the rest of it, um, it's got some self-oiling bearings inside of it that's supposed to take care of everything. Um, and it really does on a pretty good basis. You are supposed to take it in or have it looked at. Um, I think they're recommending either every six months or once a year, depending upon usage, that it should be taken in and serviced by a um, certified technician. Okay, thank you. Um, Brian, there's a question coming in on an SWF 1501C. Um, it has oil wicks, and the person's asking how often should drops be added uh, since you can't see any tanks. Um, I would generally, you know, keep an eye on that every every day. It all really depends on where they are on the machine. Again, just like what Marcia was talking about, there's certain areas you want to do to the fine uh, or pen oiler, and there's others where you can use the standard bottle, the um, the extender that you can oil with that, but uh, you definitely want to keep an eye on those because I'm finding, especially with the SWFs, um, that if you don't keep enough oil in those, um, you'll, you'll have some problems. Okay. And someone is asking about um, 
uh, the procedure for lubricating the needle bar on a Recoma 1501? Um, generally, taking the front covers off, uh, they're kind of hard to get to um, just by trying without unthreading it, unfortunately. Um, so just taking and unthreading and taking the covers off and oiling your needle bars with a, with a uh, needle um, pen oiler, um, that should do it. Okay. Thanks. And that should be done the same schedule with just about any embroidery machine, again, based on usage. Um, from once a week to maybe every other week. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Marsha, let's take a look at um, monthly maintenance, if you could begin this one, please. I can. Monthly maintenance, um, this is actually um, listed in most manufacturing, even though it falls under maintenance. It, they kind of list it sometimes as cleaning as opposed to maintenance, but it is in the maintenance schedule, so they get a little kind of strange with their verbiage on that. Um, but basically, um, once, once a month, remove your needle plates, um, mainly on machines that you're doing an awful lot of trimming because they're, the knives are going to actually put these little small pieces of thread and they're going to build up all over the place underneath your needle plate. So um, it's definitely recommended to take these, take them off, clean them out. It's a great time to also clean out. You get a better direct look at your rotary hook. Um, and clean out any dirt and debris that happens to be underneath there. Um, your control boxes, um, no matter what machine it is, there is always going to be an in and an out. And basically, it's like a computer. It has to suck air in and push air out because it has to keep it cool. So if you actually do not do this, I was just at a customer's yesterday, and he it was so thick I rolled it off of his control box. Um, so you do not want to be doing that because it's going to overheat. And if it overheats, it's just like a computer. It's, it's just not going to function correctly, and you're going to start losing some boards. So it is definitely recommended that you do this at least once a month. If you are in a real dusty, dusty shop, it's never going to hurt to clean this every other week. Um, and also make sure, because I've gone into way too many shops, people tend to put boxes um, up against these. And again, now you've stopped the airflow. So then you can actually, again, you're restricting the way that the, the computer's breathing. So it's just, it's going to have a hard time. Okay, a question, um, Marsha, where are the control boxes? Um, well, the one that you're seeing on the right-hand side of your screen right now, that's a um, brother um, single head. And you can see that there's one on one side and one on the other. On um, a Barrett and single head, the, um, the uh, vent areas are on the on and off box, which are on the bottom. So they're usually wherever your on and off switches are, your, your main on and off switch. I guess I should put it that way. Because as with um, a couple of different machines, you have, you, know, you have to turn your power on on one spot, and then you might be turning or twisting something at your control panel, which is turning it on. So wherever that main switch is, you're going to be wanting to look near there because that's probably where you're going to find it. On a brother, bigger machine, it's, it is on that same main switch. There's three in the back and then there's two in the front. Okay, thank you. Um, you're welcome. A Baradin, a Baradin question um, someone wrote in about a specific model, um, but the, I think the concern might uh, spread over other people as well. Uh, and the concern was that the manual that came with the machine was not in English that was particularly understandable or helpful. And so we've got a couple people that are writing in um, with Baradins looking for an, a manual um, information that is more um, user friendly. Can you suggest what they can do? I would suggest that they, one, go to the Baradin, I think it's Baradin USA or Dash USA and go to their website. Okay. They have, um, they have a, t a support center that you can print out pot manuals, you can look for lubrication out there, um, and they have all kinds of information that you can look at yourself. And they also have um, a tech page that you can actually email the Barrett and Technician questions. So if you're not finding what you're looking for on their particular website, I would definitely recommend that you either email them or on the page somewhere there is also a, um, a phone number for you to contact somebody. Okay, thank you. You're welcome.
Brian, could you continue with the monthly maintenance? Okay. Um, you see the front and rear shaft bearings. Um, <clears throat> Those bearings there control the rotary hook shaft or the oscillating shaft. Um, I'm more of a daily guy on those because the years and years of working on Tajimas, I've had people that have not oiled it monthly or six monthly or, or at all in some cases, and I've had those shafts seized. So I'm kind of a once a day guy when they oil their hooks, just put a drop in there and you, you're just fine. It really does prevent any kind of shaft seizures. Um, the rear shaft is generally um, the newer machines don't have a bushing there so you're really putting a drop of oil on the shaft itself. Um, for whatever reason that one I'm not too concerned about. I'll do that more, late, more uh, once a week or every other week. Um, the cam grooves, uh, that may be brother talk, so Marsh, do you want to take that? Um, yeah, cam grooves um, on a brother machine, it's a two-sided cam. You have one side that runs your press a foot and the other side that runs your take-up levers. So this particularly usually is done um, mostly by a technician at this point because usually in order to get to this, you're removing a lot of covers and you're removing, um, sometimes you may even need to remove the head itself in order to get at it. Um, you can get at it from moving the needles from one side to the other, um, and usually you use um, a white lithium, um, and we don't recommend normally a spray here. Um, it's usually a uh, tube of white lithium, um, usually comes with your machine, it's in a small little white and blue round container. Um, there's actually two of them that come used to come with the brother machines. There would be white and there would be black. And we recommend that you use the white in this area. And you just fill, put it in one of the grooves of the cam. And then when the machine actually distributes, um, turns on and starts moving, it's going to distribute it to the rest of that particular cam. So you don't have to fill the whole cam. You just need to get it into a groove, probably something about the size of what you'd be able to fit on the end of a screwdriver or a tongue depressor. Um, anything along that line, but it doesn't have to be tons and tons, and you do not have to fill the entire groove. Okay, one, Marcia, one question that came in. Yeah, I will in. say that with, with the... Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Brian. No, I will say with the Tajimas, uh, uh, Mar Marcia, that, yeah, with the Tajimas, taking the... You'll have to take the needle case off, and you really have to get in there, and I don't recommend customers doing that. That's something that I generally do once a year, um, take all the heads off and get all the cams, um, just so I know that there's a decent amount of grease in there that my uh, bearings of the cam follower does not seize. Correct. Brian, a question just came in on, on a Tajima. Is the front oil shaft the little hole on the arm behind the needle plate? Um, it's actually right in, right behind the needle plate. If you're looking at the needle plate, there's a little hole there. And sometimes it's marked uh, with a little red mark on it. Um, yes, that is the front or oscillating shaft uh, bearing. Okay. And a, a kind of a broad question, but um, how do you clean uh, the knives? Question. Um, usually you can just clean them with canned air. If you really, truly wanted to, you could remove the fixed knife. I never recommend removing the movable knife. And I usually don't recommend removing knives at all. Um, usually if you just take some canned air, you should be able to push anything that's underneath the knives and catching underneath. Or if you might need to take some tweezers and help convince it out if you haven't been there for a few months, you could have a big buildup behind there. But if you're doing cleaning out your rotary hook every single day um, and you're blowing canned air in that general area, you shouldn't have such a buildup that you should have to remove anything. You should be able to take care of it just by using canned air and some tweezers. Oh, good to know. <laughs> um, Brian, could you, we've had a couple of questions come in and, and we touched on this at the beginning and I, I can't remember if we come back to it at the end of the webinar or not, hook wash. Um, a couple of people asked what it was. Um, someone asked if the WD-40 is better or not than hook wash, and Nancy pointed out that it wasn't WD-40, but 
something else that was in the picture at the beginning. Um, could you talk a little bit about the purpose of book wash? Uh, we might like, have to. We'll come back. We'll to come Brian. back to Brian. <laughs> we we lost audio, so um, he's coming back, but it might take a little while. Brian. Yep, I can hear you now. Okay, we can hear you now. Um, sorry for that. Uh, I'm not sure okay. what end that was, but that was we lost you just for a little bit. And a question um, that's come in from a number of people is concerning hook wash. Wondered if you could talk about its use. Um, I know that you all are a fan of it. If you could talk a little bit about what you like to use it for, um, that would be helpful. Sure. Uh, I've been using it for quite some time. Um, I like it as a technician if I'm working, especially with uh, you know parts that are, have grease, oil, etc. It really cleans up the parts really nice. But generally for the operators, um, I love it using it on the rotary hook. It really does get all the, the junk that builds up in rotary hooks. People that use spray tack and that spray tack inherently builds up inside the rotary hook and causes issues. So it really dissolves that, that sticky spray material that's used. Um, generally spraying the rotary hook and the knives while you're there, uh, letting it sit for for about a minute, if you're keeping up with it on a weekly basis, maybe 30 seconds, blowing it off with whatever air you have, uh, and you'll be surprised how much stuff really it does come out of there and keeping your hooks nice and clean. It does have uh, oiling properties, although I do recommend, again, after you've cleaned it, using your machine manufacturer's uh, uh, oil. Okay, thank you. Let's take a look, Marcia, if you could start us off on three-month maintenance. Um, three month maintenance usually involves um, bevel, be, excuse me, bevel gears, um, your color change. Um, on most machinery, in order to get any of what is called the bevel gears, you're going to have to remove some sort of plate, usually at the rear of your machine, and it's where the shaft from the front from the rotary hook comes and meets at the back with the main shaft. Um, and this is metal against metal. So you really want to make sure that you um, either do this yourself or make sure that a technician does it when they come in. Um, and this is usually very something that I always make sure I do. I always start at the back of a machine and work my way towards the front of the machine. Um, these particular gears, um, on some machines, you get one piece that's plastic and one piece that's metal. Um, and the reason for that is because if you jam your rotary hook, they want the plastic one to break so that it doesn't destroy the rest of your machine. <clears throat> so um, make sure, making sure that there is enough grease in there. And basically all you're going to do is you're going to, again, take some white lithium grease. You're going to put it on a few of the teeth right where the two gears come together. And once you rotate it, it's going to distribute the grease throughout the rest of it. Now, if you wanted to walk it along and put it through each one of the teeth as you're rolling the machine by hand, you can definitely do that. Um, I am going to just back up a little bit. Anytime you're doing this, the power on your machine should be off. <laughs> um, I have had one too many customers tell me that somebody did something at the front of the machine while they were doing this and they've sucked shirts in or um, they've sprayed themselves with grease and oil. Um, so just beware. Make sure you shut your machine off when you're doing any of the maintenance. Um, when you're doing your color change one, you may on some models have to remove the thread tensioner of usually its head number. Well, it depends on which model you're on, but it's usually the one that's closest to your control panel. Um, and that's usually where your worm gear is going to be. And again, all you need to do is get some grease into one of the grooves, and then as it changes color, it will distribute it throughout the rest of that particular worm gear. Um, some of the other ones also will have, um, I'm going to just call it a gear box, and basically it's where um, everything comes together at one end of your machine, and it's helping the belt side of it move along with the rest of the shaft. And there's usually, um, on a brother machine, there's actually um, two upper gears and one lower gear, and they kind of mesh together. Um, you do need to make sure that you put some grease into this particular area. And also, right there, if you happen to have this particular model, there's also a red dot that the manufacturer does not tell you to do anything with. 
Um, if you see a red dot on something, mainly on embroidery machines, red dots usually mean oil. Um, so definitely while you have this cover off on this particular model, make sure that you put some oil in that particular area. It's not going to hurt anything and it's actually, if you look, you'll see there's some um, wave gears and some wave washers that are sitting right on each side of um, some bearings. So it actually does help lubricate it. Okay, thank you. Um, You're welcome. Brian, before, before we leave hook wash, a uh, question came in. Um, someone embroiders a lot of pleather, um, plastic leather for anyone. It's easier to read it and know what, they're, what they mean. But um, is there a recommended method for getting out the sticky goo that builds up on the knife and the rotary? Is, would that be hook wash? Would it be appropriate? That would be definitely hook wash. Okay. okay. Absolutely. So there we have a plug for hook wash there based on answering that question. Um, okay, let's move to the next slide, which is going to be um, looking at maintenance that should take place over six months. Uh, Brian, do you want to start us off on this one? Sure. Um, <clears throat> the six-month maintenance, uh, the greasing, the color change assembly, um, again, as Marsha had mentioned earlier, uh, getting to the color change sometimes takes a little bit of work. Sometimes it, moving the needle case over to needle number one. Um, there should be, uh, at least with the Tajimas anyway, there's a white octagon type shape cover with two or three screws based on your model. Uh, you should be able to easily slide that cover off and there you'll see the color change cam or worm gear. Um, and again, there's two different ways you can do it. Uh, if you don't want to take the cover off, you don't want a big mess, you'll see behind uh, head one, you'll see uh, some roller bearings based on how many needles you have. You can grease those little roller bearings and it will feed into the color change cam. Um, for extra credit, if you wanted to go ahead and oil grease your cams up at well, then you'll know at least six months from now that you won't have a color change seizing up on you. Um, the color change linear rails. Uh, based on how many heads you'll, you'll have a linear rail. Uh, I like to keep those things as clean as I can because the whole concept of the linear rail <clears throat> is it has very, very tiny uh, ball bearings. And if you start to get dirt building in there as the needle cases are moving from side to side, it will jam them up and you will have issues. So keeping them clean and putting a spot of oil on each side of the linear rail, so putting the head at, uh, if you have a 12, putting it at needle six and so forth, just putting a drop there and moving it around, moving your needle case back and forth will keep them working for a very long time. Okay, thank you. Marcia, um, did you so want to... Th Yep, this is actually, um, these are called linear rails, but these are linear rails that help you pantograph move from side to side, front to back and left to right. <clears throat> you do want to make sure that, um, I usually recommend that you clean off whatever was there before. Now that doesn't mean I want you to go out and get any type of solvent to clean it, I just want you to clean it with a rag, especially if you use some buildup. Um, it used to be recommended that we use um, a white lithium um, grease on this um, and unfortunately what we found was over time um, it got stiff and thick and it really did start to make some of a mess. It became very gluey. So if your machine happens to have that then yes you're definitely going to need to try to clean it off and then re-lubricate everything again as far down as you can get it. Um, if you really have to take any type of solvent um, I highly recommend just use rubbing alcohol. Um, because rubbing alcohol will dry up. It's not going to stay behind. But if you use this, you definitely need to make sure that you um, use some extra grease on this um, when you're putting it um, grease back on it again. And normally on this particular one, what I would do is I move it, if I'm going and using the left to right linear, um, I'll move it all the way to one side. I'll take some white lithium grease, I'll put it on my finger, and I'll run it down the whole length of the rail. It should look like Vaseline. It doesn't want to be caked on there because what's going to happen is you're going to end up with that buildup again if you end up doing it. You'll end up with it at one end or the other because there's little ball bearings in here, just like they are on the ones that run back and forth for your head. These have the same thing underneath. 
And if you end up putting too much and that gets caked up inside, those little ball bearings are going to have issues. And they're not going to move. You're going to get a chattery movement. It's not going to move well. So you definitely do not want to over grease this. Um, and you want to keep it as clean as you possibly can without having to use any solvent to take it off. Um, if you just use a regular rag, if you've been keeping up with it, you should be able to take whatever's there off. And you should be able to just put some more back on. And then once you've done one side, if you just turn around and just slide it all the way over, and then the ball bearings will pick up as it's moving along, and then do the other side, and then, and then push it again back to the opposite so that it actually works itself into the bearing packs. Um, and the same thing when you're doing the front to back one. Um, front to back one is the same principle. You're going to push it all the way to the back of the machine um, and actually do some, um, put some thin film of grease on there pull it all the way forward, do it again, and then push it all the way back again. On a Barrett machine, on the newer ones, they just have one that you need to take care of, and it's going to be over towards where your control panel is on the right-hand side underneath everything. And it's a long rail, and they recommend, again, cleaning it off. Again, just clean it off with a rag. And then you, they actually recommend that you use a spray um, white lithium in this particular spot. Um, Marsha, a couple questions um, going backwards a little bit. What is the linear rail? What purpose does it serve? The linear rail in this particular is to help your machine move from left to right. Um, it helps it glide, the pantograph, how it glides from one side to the other. It's to keep it straight. It's to keep it from having to um, maybe have a stepping motion in it. Um, all machines have a front and back linear rails. Even the ones, because now a brother machine is also, let alone they have linear rails, and I think most of the other models may too, they either have a belt or they will have um, wires. Brother machines have X and Y wires um, that um, are, help assist the pantograph along its way through the electronics of how big the stitch is, how far it's going to move in order to create the stitch. Brian, someone asking about a Tajima um, C1501 saying that it looks like the rails are contained and they're asking if they would do it on that as well. Yeah, most of the Tajimas from single heads all the way up to 20 head um, are pretty contained. Uh, I tell people don't try to get a little brush in there and put some grease because that belt's going to start slipping. Um, they're generally a self-contained, self-maintained unit. If you're, if you have to go in there, um, then there's obviously a problem with the belt or something is jammed up with the rail. But if you just take your air gun and you blow it out, and keep the dust and lint out of there, um, those linear rails run pretty, pretty good. Okay. And Marsha, if lithium grease isn't recommended for the linear rails, what kind of grease is? Um, it would depend on what the manufacturer, but most of these linear rails, it's going to be either a spray form of lithium grease or a um, tube form. I actually carry it in both, um, depending on if I can get my hands in to um, actually put it on my finger and actually spread it down. If I can't, um, some of the baritons, you don't have enough room to do that, so you would actually use a spray. Okay, thank you. And what you were saying, Marsha, if I'm correct, is just to be careful not to use too much. That is correct, because that just can create a whole different problem. Yeah. Okay, our final slide of six-month maintenance. Um, if Brian or Marsha, if one of you would like to address this one. Uh, greasing the presser foot assembly, again, that, that kind of works as far as the GM is concerned. Uh, the color, the, the uh, presser foot cam um, and the needle bar cam, so that kind of plays into it to GEMA wise. Um, so, Marsha, you want to take that for the brother end? Um, on the brother end, again, this is another spot that people tend to um, want to fill it. <laughs> Don't fill it. <laughs> it's it's just one, if you overfill it, it's going to create these nice little gobs, and those little gobs, when the press of foot goes up and down, is going to fall down onto your garment. And then you're going to have gobs on your garment where you don't want it. 
So just, again, a small amount of white lithium grease, and usually, again, it's not a spray here. It's actually the one that you would have in the container that came with your machine. Um, the, the picture that you see on your right-hand side with that blue um, drum on it, because that's actually what it's called, um, it has these wires wrapped around it, and you can see there's a red arrow pointing it to a slot. Um, most people, actually 98% people, forget to do this particular spot, and it is so important, especially if in an area that if you live and there's a lot of humidity, um, because what it does is there is a shaft that runs through there, and again, this is all metal back there except for these two plastic pieces that you're seeing. But in order to make these drums work, there's actually um, a metal um, shaft or a pin that runs right through there, and what has happened over time is it will become pitted um, because it's the moisture that gets in there and it doesn't get any lubrication. Um, and this one, I, I can't tell you how many people, I take a cover off when I go in and do it, and they say, oh, what are you doing? How come you're doing that? <laughs> and I'm like, well, you know, you should have been doing this at, at minimum once a year. But um, I live in New England. I would be doing it every six months. Hmm. Uh, question, Marcia, is lithium grease good um, or, I guess, safe to use in a high-dust environment? It is, but again, it's it's the amount that you use. Okay. If you're going to use gobs of it, and that is the, why I keep saying don't use a lot of it, because if you use a lot of it, anything that flies by is going to, it's, it's like a magnet. It's like gobbles up all this dirt and the lint and everything else. So if you're using it, you want to use it sparingly. You're better off doing it more frequent, frequently with less grease than doing it less with more grease. Okay, thank you. Um, let's return to maintenance schedule. Um, Marsha, I know um, you had a, a story with this one, and I, I think that maybe if you could start off with uh, the importance of um, coming. We've kind of gone full circle, <laughs> taking a look at not only should you start a main, uh, maintenance schedule, but keeping it. If you want to talk about this for a bit. I will, because maintenance schedule, the schedule itself, and keeping track of it is probably the hardest thing for a technician to get an owner to do. Um, if you turn around and you spend $50,000 for a car, you are going to take it to the dealership every single day or every time that it needs to have its maintenance done. You're spending just about that much for these pieces of equipment. Why wouldn't you keep track of it? If I want to know what the maintenance is on my car, all I have to do is call the dealership up and they're going to be able to keep track of it. When a technician comes into your shop and you ask, hey, where's your oil or where's your grease, and you have to spend 10 minutes looking for it, that already is telling us that you're not doing it. So it's really important to try to make sure that you set something up. And sometimes it's a little difficult in the more bigger shops, or sometimes it's easier because you have one person doing all the maintenance for, for every single machine. But you really want to try to set something up so that you can turn around and say, yep, this got done. No, it didn't get done. Hey, did, you, did this person do it? And it's as easy as set up a Google Calendar and somebody's got to check it off that they did it. Um, I, I just, I, we hope as technicians we will tell you we want something oiled or greased once a week. We're hoping in reality that we're getting it twice a week, twice every once every two weeks but we really truly would like you to do what the manufacturer is recommending it's going to save you so much time and money in the long run and then when the technician comes in they don't have to spend as much time trying to figure out what's been done and what's not been done thank you i knew you had a good analogy that that uh, compared to the the cost and the importance and the uh the care of a of an embroidery machine with a with a fancy car um, a question that just came in, which is perfectly timed, is how do I know when it's time to change my needle? So we're going to go to the next slide, and I'm going to ask um, Nancy to talk about proper threading with your needles and um, thread tensioning. Yeah, we're going to go over a couple, um, couple of slides here in addition to actual maintenance to the machines themselves, um, the extenuating items that are going to affect 
how well your machine runs as well. And one of those is needles. Um, we are going to start with um, start with the threading of your machine and the thread tensioning. Um, thread tensions are probably um, it's a very high percentage of why a thread breaks. Um, if you don't have that proper tension on these high speed machines, your machines can run you know up to 1200 stitches a minute right now um, at this point that I know of um, that's the highest one that's really really fast and if the tensions not set properly within that um, tolerance level then that machine no matter how much you oil it no matter how much you clean it it's just not going to run well a um, couple of things that you have here is you have your bobbin tension gauge so you can set your bobbin tension gauge properly I highly recommend this particular product for brand new customers new to the um, industry um, you're just learning a machine you want to make sure that the bobbin thread is tensioned first um, and you want to do that whether you're new whether you're old um, that's where you start your tensioning is with the bobbin case itself um, the tension gauge helps you maintain that and it helps you learn what the correct tension is. Uh, once you figure that out, it's um, generally people will use that drop test with your bobbins um, to check the tension. That's a perfect way to um, set it. But then you want to keep in mind that field test over time can actually skew a little bit. So you want to make sure you go back to your tension gauge gauges um, from time to time just to ensure that you are um, within the tolerance level. Um, so once you get your bobbin um, thread tension properly, now you're going to work on your top thread tension and of course you have your um, anywhere from 6 to 15 needles or 16 needles now um, that you're going to have to tension on the top. And the little tension gauge there on the two right hand side is perfect for um, as a guide or as a starting point when it comes to your tension gauge. Um, one thing we, um, if you haven't noticed, we have a couple of handouts available and the handouts, two of the handouts that are there um, included in that is the um, how to properly tension um, with these particular gauges. So these are, um, oh, and then also with the threading of the machine, you want to make sure, you know, sometimes when a thread breaks, um, it kind of springs up, depends on the type of thread you're using, some will spring a little more than others, but very often some of those tensioners that are holding the thread will actually um, come undone. So you, you're trying to tension your machine and you just can't get it to tighten or loosen. Um, most likely tighten, you can't tighten it. Go Make sure you're, as you're pulling your thread, you're looking up each time to make sure your thread is through all of the loops, um, the tensions, the hooks, and all that, because each one of those does play a um, specific role in making sure your thread is tensioned. Okay, and Brian, how about um, replacing the bobbin case? Could you go over the step? Well, as far as replacing your bobbin case, you pretty much have to, as you're changing bobbins, I always recommend just check your tension. It's going to take a couple seconds just doing the yo-yo test. And if you notice that your, your thread tension on your bobbin case is a little tight or a little loose, by using the larger of the two screws on your bobbin case to make your adjustment. If you notice if you loosen it a, a little bit and it falls to the ground or you tighten it a little bit and it doesn't move at all, if you've done your maintenance on your bobbin case and you're still having that problem, change your bobbin case. Um, if you have a bobbin case set and then some manufacturers use the little pigtail on the top of the bobbin case, if it's broken, change it. It's just the machine is just not going to run well without that. The manufacturer plans on that being there and if it's not there you're going to have issues so that's that's when I change my bobbin cases and I run into it a lot where I'll ask the customer do you have any bobbin cases no I don't have any um, so I always recommend have a box there get a box it, it'll take you a while to use them up but they're there in case you have to change them out Brilliant. yeah I kind of find that as well um, especially when you you swear you've done everything that you can try everything um, you've done to get the thread to run um, and then you find once you pop that new case in you realize it's actually running well I did want to point out um, earlier in the webinar here somebody questioned what is the tension spring and Brian would you, on that third picture from the right it shows the piece of cardboard underneath the tension spring itself um, if you could just explain, like, what is the, the spring on a bobbin case? Well, that tension spring is what controls your tension on your bobbin. And if you don't maintain this well, you'll get an excess buildup of lint. Uh, sometimes the materials from uh, the wax from the bobbin itself will build up, and, and 
you'll start to notice that, hey, my, my tension don't look all that well. And by cleaning it with a piece of backing, uh, a piece of cardboard, a business card, or as I said earlier about a piece of uh, plastic water bottle, uh, if you'll notice the stuff coming in. And then after that, take your air gun and blow it out just to make sure you've got absolutely everything out of there because you'll start to notice there's an excessive buildup inside the back end of that bobbin case. And eventually that stuff's going to move around and it's going to go right where that spring is. Um, Brian, a question for you, actually two. How does a bobbin case go bad? Is it the amount of use or is it, could it be something? Uh, again, it, it, uh, just, wear, just wear and tear. I mean, like I say, if you maintain them, cleaning them pretty much every time you change a bobbin, they're going to last you quite a while. What a quite a while is, there's no real, uh, every six months, there's, there's no real time frame on it. So. Uh, maintain it. You won't be changing them as often. Okay. Um, and someone has asked a question about a magnetic bobbin case. I'm, I'm pretty sure they mean magnetic bobbins. And if you think that it is hype or if it is really something that improves the running of the bobbin. Um, I highly recommend them to my customers. Um, I really like the way they run. Uh, setting tensions with them is no different really than changing them on a regular cardboard or cardboard less bobbin. Um, I like the way they run. Um, okay. Thank you. And the one thing I do find is that they will go all the way to the end. They will run out absolutely where you've used every part of that bobbin. Okay. Well, it also makes it easier when you have to train somebody new. If you have to train somebody new, trying to put a paper bobbin in and getting them to do it consistently the same all the time seems to be a little bit of a challenge. I had one woman that actually yeah, told clockwise me... clockwise and counterclockwise. Yeah, oh, no, this is incorrectly. See, I can see the letters on my paper bobbin. <laughs> well, that doesn't really matter. It has to go in a specific awesome. direction. Right. So at least when you're using the magnetic ones, if they put it in incorrectly and they flip it over and it falls in the hand, it's not correct. <laughs> if they put it in, they flip it over, and it stays in the bobbin case, it's correct. Right. The bobbin should spin clockwise when you pull it. If it's facing you, correct. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I asked my needle question a little bit too soon. Um, so, Marsha, we're going to turn this over to you. Um, how changing needles falls into machine maintenance, and the question, how do I know when I should change my needle? Changing, but that is probably, uh, Brian probably gets that question every time he trains somebody. How do I know when to change a needle? Just remember baseball analogy. One, two, three. Unexplained breaks, frays, hiccups, looping, not looking right. It's a 16 cent repair. Um, the needle gripper that, that the, you're showing in the picture here, I highly recommend that people get these. It just makes the job so much easier because you can actually lock it in place so that you know where the front and the back is and you'll be able to have the free hand to be able to kind of steer it to make sure it's in correctly and then you push it all the way up. I do have some manufacturers, um, these are really big shops that are running two and three shifts. They'll come in and the operator, they know they've been running black and white all day. They will immediately just change black and white out because they know they're running it for the next eight hours. Um, by changing the needle, it gives them better quality. The needle actually penetrates the garment better. It can form the loop better, and it makes it a little bit tighter. Um, it also reduces the amount of friction um, if it's a new needle, so they actually um, change it out so that they have less issues going along. But the average person, we don't keep track of, oh, did I use white all day today? Well, I might have, but I didn't use it a whole bunch. And there's only an eyeball in this one, but over here in this design, it's bigger. So you really don't know the amount of stitches that you're putting onto a needle. But if you just kind of remember, I'm having, th I had three, kind of very close together. Not I had one in the morning and one tomorrow morning and then three days later. That doesn't count as three consecutive or close together. Usually it's something that's within the same pattern. It's been running fine all day long. And now all of a sudden, I can't get past this particular point on this needle. Take it out put a new one in, and you probably will be all set and on your way. And again, it's just a 16 cent repair. Okay. Thank you very much.
Um, I'm going to answer the last question that came in a little while ago. Uh, someone wrote in that they are based in Raleigh, North Carolina. How do I find a tech near me? Um, we have on our Madeira USA website a uh, list. It's a guide of all the techs that we came across that um, kind of passed the litmus test as far as being very respected by one another. Um, you see here the uh, contact information for both Marsha and Brian. Um, we we found them on our on our list as well. So they are both based in um, in Massachusetts, but they are um, have have uh, toolbox will travel. So they are um, available. Um, I'm sure would appreciate a call if you're looking for a tech for your machine. Um, we've come to the end of our webinar, and we'd really, really like to thank everyone who stayed with us, um, as well as Marsha and Brian and Nancy. Thank you so much um, for all the information that you shared. Thank I, want to, I want to remind everybody that um, is still with us that we have collected all of your questions, and we will be working diligently to get them all answered, and we'll be emailing you the complete Q&A. So please don't be disappointed if we haven't been able to answer your question on air. Um, we'll also be sending you links to the recorded webinar um, as well as to a PDF um, for those who prefer a print version. Again, here's the contact information for both Brian and Marsha if you have future need for their services. Um, and Madeira would like to offer you two specials. And Nancy, would you please um, just go into a little detail of what this kit contains? Absolutely. Um, so you can see the picture there of what is included. We're going to um, give you that hook wash. Um, it's going to include the hook wash that's in there, the canned air, precision screwdriver, um, the precision pen oiler um, that is great for your rotary hook area and the front and rear shaft and the larger um, thing of oil there for your larger areas. Um, additionally, there's a glass cleaner that is great for your tabletops. Um, for your embroidery machines themselves, the cleaning brush, and my favorite, that little utility tray I keep next to each machine, um, and it holds your scissors, your snips, your oil, um, everything that you need on a regular basis there. So that's over $45 value that we're going to offer you for $30, and um, just make sure you order it by that item number there, and if you do order that kit, we'll offer you additionally 10% um, off with the promo code that you see there. So some people are asking about discounts on the bobbin gauge, um, the TOA, TOA um, top tension gauge. Um, order that kit, use that promo code, and order um, any other products will give you 10% off all non-sale products. So got a great deal going on there for you. And also for those that were asking about hoop wash, I think I see some hoop wash in that kit. <laughs> they do. Um, somebody wrote the um, item number for that kit is MM-1, no letter A at the end. Okay, again, um, thank you all for your time. We hope you've enjoyed the webinar. Please stay in touch, and um, our next webinar will be coming up in a, in a couple of weeks. Thank you.